cara kita membawa suatu aplikasi itu go international. Di sini anak-anak TI kan developer aplikasi semua. Ya, ya. Oke, okay. uh, mungkin let's give a pause for Mr. Chuan Wong, please. Thank you. Hello, hello. It's great to be here. In Indonesia is the most uh, social country on the earth, right? Very good. When, when I came here, when I came here this morning, I, I checked in with Foursquare. How many, how many people are using Foursquare? Evidently, I, I think a lot of you are using Foursquare, yeah. Right? And in other places in Asia, like Korea or Taiwan or other places that I go, not many people are using Foursquare. Uh, but I was really impressed that you guys are using Foursquare a lot. So that's great. Now, right now, we are having a hackathon at uh, a, a different location, Venus University at a different location. Uh, and the two APIs that they're using are Evernote and Foursquare. So it's a great mashup of two great APIs. So we're very happy to be here in Jakarta. And I know uh, Sartika, and uh, she was just in the United States a few short weeks ago with us at our development conference called the, the ETC, the Evernote Trump Conference. And I told Sartika that I was coming back to Jakarta and she wanted me to speak to a few students. She said maybe 60 students. And I said, okay, that sounds great. And then I come today and I see like, you know, however many are here, there's a lot more than 60. <laughs> so she tricked me. <laughs> so I, I heard him ask, I heard him ask earlier, is, it, is anyone using Evernote? Who, who knows what Evernote even is? Is there anyone that knows what Evernote is? Not one? Only Sartika? Oh, you have one guy. Oh, two? Okay. Looks like I have some work to do. So two. Okay, good, good. Uh, after I'm done, make sure that you two come up and, and talk to me, okay? I'll give you a, a special something. Okay. Um, so today what I wanted to talk about, since you guys are all in the IT industry, right? You're, you're studying to become either developers or administrators of IT systems. Uh, I thought that I would talk a little bit about uh, taking a company international. Because a lot of the companies today, or a lot of the applications that you guys can create, can very easily go international very quickly, right? Uh, you guys probably don't remember this. You're not old enough, like me. Uh, but there was a day with software where we used to go to a store. Im imagine this, think about this. We used to go to a store if there was a software that you wanted to use on your computer, and you would have to pick a box up off a shelf and go and pay for it, okay? And in that box was a CD, CD-ROM. Do you guys still use CD-ROMs occasionally? Maybe a little bit? That CD-ROM you would put into your, to your laptop or your computer, your desktop computer, and you would install the software, right? Then you can use it. This is very similar to like Microsoft Office or something like that. But then the iPhone came out and there was something created called apps, right? And that kind of changed everything. So apps were created, and then app stores were also created. So what that did is it changed the, the overall marketplace very quickly. So someone in Indonesia could come out with a great app and distribute that app to anyone in the world very easily for very low cost, right? So what that did is it changed the world of software. So 
software used to be a game where if you spent a lot of money on marketing, then people would go and buy your software. And the person with the most money won, okay? But that's changed. Now it's not the person with the most money, it's the person with the best app that wins. So if you can build an app that people will talk about to their friends, then that's an app that's gonna win in the marketplace. And you don't really have to spend much money. So Evernote is a boring application. Okay, I'll admit it. But once you start using it, it's very addictive. <laughs> so it's not like a Twitter, it's not like a Foursquare or a Facebook. It's not highly social. Now I know that you guys are social, but for a long time, our CEO used to say that Evernote is antisocial. And the reason he said that is Evernote is a product that is built for you personally to store anything you want to remember, okay? So that's just a, a, a brief overview of, of what we do, and I'll explain a little bit more why that's important. But right now, across the globe, okay, every day we get about 60 to 70,000 new users every day. So we're growing very, very quickly. Now evidently I need to get more of you, <laughs> but Every day, Evernote is growing very, very fast. There's many new people coming onto the platform, and we do all of that without any marketing. Uh, we don't buy advertisements, we don't buy users, we don't buy exposure. That all comes through people talking to their friends about what Evernote is. So that's what we'll be talking a little bit about today. And today I wanna to focus a little bit on, on taking a company global. So how do you create an application here in, in Jakarta and then take it throughout the world? How do you do that? So I, I'll talk a little bit about that today. How are we doing? Are you guys bored yet? You better not be, okay? Let's keep the, I, I, you know, let's keep the energy up, all right? Um, so why do we go global? Why do you want to go global? Well, the first thing is, is you want to get more users, right? And it's a big world and people are using mobile phones now everywhere. So you can get software to literally any corner of the globe. In fact, when I checked into my uh, hotel uh, in Kuala Lumpur, I was wearing my Evernote t-shirt and the person who checked me in saw my t-shirt and said, do you work for Evernote? I said, why yes I do. And he said, wow, I use Evernote. So literally, you can reach anyone wherever they may be. So users is a big reason that you might want to go global with an application. Second reason is you want to find talent. One of the reasons that we're here today, in fact the major reason that I'm in um, uh, Jakarta today, is for the hackathon that we're doing with Daily Social. So that's going on right now, and in fact they're going to be finished with the hackathon in a few hours, and they're going to show us what they've created. So finding talent is a very important thing, and it's tough to find talent in just one place. So at Evernote, we have people from everywhere, all over the world, that are working on building Evernote. A key thing for us, and for many applications, is finding partners. So we partner with uh, mobile carriers, we partner with handset manufacturers, and, and other entities like that. Uh, so that we can get exposure to the marketplace through our partners. So that's another reason to go global. The last thing is uh, money. Okay, so if you're building an application, you need a little bit of money to keep it going, to keep developers working on it, to keep it going forward. And in today's connected kind of social society, you can meet people from all over the globe that want to invest in these types of technologies. In fact, let me tell you a quick little story here. Evernote um, in 2008 was running out of money and our CEO was uh, doing emails, just kind of laying in bed really late at night, doing emails. And he was 
thinking that he was going to tell his employees that he was going to close the company the next day because there was no more money left. And an email came in, and it was from a user in Switzerland. And that user said, gee, Phil, I really love Evernote. Thank you for creating it. I'm using it all the time. It really helps me, and a bunch of things like that. And at the end of the email, he said, oh, and by the way, if you ever need financing, if you ever need money, let me know, because I'd be interested in investing. And Phil wrote him an email, and then they talked on Skype. And within two weeks, that person had invested money into Evernote that saved the company and allowed us to become successful. So you never know where opportunities are gonna come from in the globe here. So what does it mean to be global? It used to mean that that little box of software that I was talking about with the DVD in it, it used to mean that you could sell that in different locations. So it used to be very difficult. If you wanted to go to Hong Kong and sell your software, you had to find a distributor. You had to get your box onto the shelf. It's just a horrible situation. That's what it used to mean to go global. But now all those problems are gone, so distribution is not a problem. So what does it mean now to go global? It means to distribute your product, yes, through app stores, typically, or through downloads and also to build your product globally, which is something that we are striving to do. We have offices in many different locations throughout the world. Um, so let me talk to you really quickly about Evernote, and I'll, I'll try not to bore you here. So Evernote is a service where you can literally capture anything you want to remember. So when I got here this morning, I met some of the professors here, uh, and they gave me their, their business cards. So I took a picture of their business cards on my mobile phone in Evernote. Now the cool thing about that is I don't have to enter in their information into my Outlook or into any database because Evernote recognizes text within images. So if I go to my Evernote on my laptop here and I search for views, it will pull up that, that card with the people that I've met here today. So there, there's many ways that you can use Evernote. In fact, I used Evernote this morning when I left my hotel room. I have a bad <coughs> habit. I travel a lot. And whenever I leave my hotel room, I'll go throughout my day, and I might get back to the hotel at 10 or 11 at night. And as soon as I get back to the hotel, I think, what was my room number? You know, I, I always forget my room number which is a problem. So rather than knocking on everyone's door and trying to find my room, what I do now is when I left this morning, I took a quick snapshot and never note of my, of my uh, uh, door number, and I guarantee you when I get home uh, tonight to the hotel that I'll have to look at that and be able to find my way back to the hotel. So that's my confession. Uh, you can also clip content from the internet. So let's say that you're reading an interesting article about uh, a programming technology or something that you're interested in. You can clip that into your Evernote very quickly, and then you can read it on your mobile phone, on your tablet, whatever you want to do. So Evernote is essentially a platform for human memory, is what it is. Um, so a few of the things that you can do, uh, that people want to remember, tasks and to-dos, research, notes, sentimental memories. I have a lot of memories of like my kids that are in Evernote. Um, whenever you're in a lecture, okay? You guys are students, so, so let's say you're in a lecture. And let's say that the professor or lecturer uh, drew some things on the whiteboard. You can take Evernote and capture that and you can search by keyword because Evernote recognizes handwriting as well. So it, it, it makes it very easy to find notes after you've taken them. Now, when people think of note taking, they usually think about typing, right? And like all the examples I'm giving are, have nothing to do with typing. It's like I, I take a lot of pictures, you can record your voice into Evernote directly on your phone. So there's a myriad of ways that you can do it other than just taking notes like you would expect. 
So we have a, a product family here. Evernote is our main application, but we have other applications that work with Evernote. Uh, one of the most uh, popular ones throughout Asia is called Evernote Food. How many people, and it's typically women that do this, but how many people take pictures of their food when they're eating? Come on, be honest. I know, I know most need to do. <laughs> so, it's like a thing, you know, like, like if you're going to eat something cool, right, you take a picture of it, put it on Twitter, you know, you kind of want to show off, right? Um, I get it. So, we have an application called Evernote Food that makes it very easy to kind of archive the people that you're meeting with and eating with and the food that you're eating. It makes it a very nice way to kind of record that. And then we also have a handwriting application. So if you have like an iPad or a Galaxy pad and you want to take handwritten notes in a class, you can do that as well through something called Penultimate over here. So we have a few few products that, that are uh, uh, interesting. So this is an example. This is actually my Evernote account from this morning. I actually took the screenshot when I was here this morning. So it's a, a little tough to see, but up here I searched for Ambassador Program. And I had a meeting about the Ambassador Program at Evernote probably like eight, nine months ago. And I wrote those notes down on a legal, just a piece of paper. And then I took a snapshot of it after I was done. And you can see, I searched for ambassador program and Evernote recognized my handwriting and pulled up that note for me. So it makes retrieval very easy. It's really cool. So as far as user growth goes, um, we started very slow, as you can see, in 2008, 2009, 2010, and in 2011 started really taking off for us. And we are going to be at about 45 million users at the end of this year. So we're growing very quickly, like I said, about 60, 70,000 new users every day. Uh, and that's all organic, so without any advertising or anything like that. So we're, we're very happy with the growth. Here's Indonesia. Okay, so we weren't localized into uh, uh, Bahasa in Indonesia uh, until about, you can kind of see where it picks up here in February, right? You see a little bump there, and then you see another little bump here. Um, those are when we localize the application into the local language. And then we also made a few trips out here to Indonesia and met with a few bloggers and journalists and things like that. So the, the awareness is starting to, to rise here in Indonesia as well. So here's our worldwide reach today. And you can see US is about 30%, Europe 20, Japan 18. And then we have a lot of Asian countries in there along with Latin America. Uh, that, and, and that's really where a lot of our growth is happening. So this pie is changing very drastically. So if you look at January, the U.S. was as high as 57% of our users. So as a percentage of our users, the U.S. is shrinking. So what are we doing? We're going global, right? That's, that's really what we're doing as a company. So... We are localized into 19 languages. And when I say 19 languages, that's for all of our applications. So that's for iOS, Android. Um, we have clients for Windows Phone. We have client for BlackBerry. We have Mac desktop. We have Windows desktop. And then we have all the tablets, etc. So it's a lot of different platforms that were localized into uh, these languages. And it's quite a big, big thing to do. Here's a couple of bookstores in um, Japan. So for some reason, Japan is like amazing for us. I, I don't know why, but uh, Japan and Korea and Taiwan, like when I go there, it's like, I feel like I'm a rock star, you know? Cause like everyone in Japan is just like, ever know, you know, they like go crazy. And it's like, whoa. So, so I feel much more comfortable that only like two people know Evernote here. So that makes me feel a lot better because it, it's a little awkward when you, like literally everywhere you go in Japan or Korea or Taiwan, it's just everyone recognizes you and, and it's kind of interesting. 
Uh, but these are all books written on Evernote. In, so if you go into any bookstore in Japan, they have like a whole section with books on Evernote. I, you know, I don't, maybe they should try using it as opposed to like just reading about it. But it's pretty interesting the, the interest that people have in, in different countries and what they do. Um, so these are a few of the partners. I talked about partners, right? So when you build software, you need to think about how are you going to get your software out to people so that they can use it. And we do it a lot through partnerships. So these guys use our API. Does anyone know what an API is? Anyone know what an API is? APK? Come on, guys. You gotta know what an API is, right? <laughs> so we, we have an open API so that other developers can tie into our application and make connections to it and work with it. So all of these partners are doing that. And here is our footprint worldwide. So in fact, I think we have two more. Uh, we just opened Taipei in Singapore. Um, so we have offices around the globe to kind of cater to the different talent sets that are around the globe that we want to have. And these are partners that we have around the globe. And our, we have a, a developer ecosystem. So like I said, we're doing a hackathon here in Jakarta. Um, and an interesting thing, there were 10 teams, okay, at this hackathon. So there were 10 teams done by Daily Social. And there were two APIs. There was us, Evernote, and Foursquare um, that you could work with to make something if you try to win the prize. And I was very surprised to learn that seven of the ten teams chose to build something on Evernote. I was very pleasantly surprised. I didn't expect that because we don't have uh, a lot of recognition here in Indonesia yet. So I was very happy to see that people were willing to build on our API for the hackathon that we just did. So here's a, a picture of the hackathon that I just got off of Twitter. Because you guys are so, so social, it was easy for me to find what was going on at the other location where they're doing the hackathon. So these are guys that right now are working on this API. It'll be interesting to see who wins. So what is involved with, with going global? There's a number of things that are involved with that, and it's, it's, it's a very difficult process. Um, you gotta design your product accordingly, and I'll show you guys a few funny examples of things that have kinda gone wrong that I have seen lately in the marketplace with product design, link, like how you use linguistics to get your point across. Um, hosting is an issue, um, you know, dealing with uh, different countries, laws and regulations, figuring out how you need to host your application to serve particular countries. Uh, support is an issue as far as uh, local language support. So we do all of our support through email, and we do some live chat, but it used to be all in English, and now we're starting to provide support in localized languages, which is kind of a challenge. Payments is something that's very important. If you want people to pay you, you gotta make it easy. So for instance, by way of example, in India, uh, they are more comfortable using cash. So we're experimenting with the ability to upgrade to the premium service of Evernote, uh, but pay with cash. So we will actually send someone out to their house, collect cash, and give them a card that they can upgrade with. So you gotta understand each individual marketplace. And I know that Indonesia has its own uh, uh, kind of unique payment uh, comfort levels with, with uh, different methodologies. Marketing is key in every different market, making sure that you're marketing the right way so that people are getting the right message. Uh, that's something that's very key, and I'll give an example about uh, some of the some things that I've seen lately, later on. Developer relations, which is what we're doing, and then business development, uh, which is talking with other companies and figuring out how you can partner to uh, have a, a mutually kind of winning relationship in the marketplace. 
And then a big one is legal, HR, and, and facilities. You guys probably will never have to worry about that, and I don't recommend that you ever do worry about that. Let someone else do that. You guys just keep being creative and, and, and creating code and, and uh, need applications. Um, the good thing is for us, we don't really have any sales or logistics. We don't have to, again, ship out any boxes or any CDs. So yeah. Um, we don't have to do that, uh, so it's very easy, and marketing is all word of mouth, which makes it very convenient for us. So, um, oh, and by the way, one, one thing that I forgot to say up front, guys, is at, at the end of this, I want to take some questions from you guys, so be thinking as I go through this stuff, if there are any questions that you want to ask, be thinking about that and we'll kind of send something around and I'll, ask them, I'll answer those. Well, hopefully I'll answer them, unless you really stump me and, and give me a hard question. But be thinking about questions that you want to ask as we go through this, okay? So, we like to say think globally, but act locally. So you want to be a global company, but you got to realize that being a global company means that you need to act locally and understand the local uh, nuances of applications in a particular country. Um, so, we say where we're from, does anyone, you know, where we're at, we're on a peninsula, so we're not so much on an island like you guys, but we're on a peninsula. But it's similar to an island, right? It's very um, isolated. You're not connected to as many places. So we have to think about, with our application, getting off the peninsula, and I think that if anyone is creating something here in Indonesia, think about getting uh, beyond the island and into different localities. That's something to think about. Um, and nothing can, can replace jumping on a plane and going and experiencing a new country, a new locality yourself. Don't ever trust anyone to do that for you. Make sure that you get on the plane, you go out there and you understand firsthand what that country is like and what the people are like, what the partners are like. Because if you trust in other people for that, it, could get, uh, it couldn't be the best outcome. So, now th this will be pretty interesting, hopefully for you guys. What I did is I wanted to find a few examples that I've seen lately of kind of uh, some things that have uh, not worked out the best when it comes to going international. So, um, the first thing is related to your brand. You need to make sure that when you're naming your company and you're coming up with a logo, that you don't offend anyone. You know, and, they, and then you don't create something that is, is going to not be adopted in different countries. Now, I think we were lucky we have an elephant as our logo, and I think that most countries generally like elephants. So we were kind of lucky. But here's an example. That, has anyone heard of Kakaoka? I'm sure, yeah, okay, good. So some of you have heard of Kakaoka. It's out of Korea, and I actually speak Korean and understand Korea pretty intimately. So um, I guarantee you what I'm about to tell you the people at Kako Talk have no idea that this is the case. But here's the deal. The other day, I discovered Kako Talk, maybe about eight, nine months ago I discovered it, and I told my wife, I said, wow, this is cool. When I travel internationally, we can use Kako Talk to stay in touch, right? And just kind of text each other back and forth, and I was all excited about it. So I said to my wife, go download Kako Talk. And she goes, what? And I said, go download this app called Kakao Talk. And she said, don't talk that way to me. And, and, I, and, and, and I'm kind of Korean a little bit because I speak Korean. So to me, I, I wasn't getting it. But here's, here's the dirty little secret that they really don't know. If you look up Kaka, C-A-C-A, -C -A, in the dictionary, does anyone know what that means? Okay. Anyone in North America, South America, Europe, or Australia all know caca to be poop. <laughs> That's what it is. Now, uh, so they have it defined down here as S-H-I-T, 
but Spanish word for crap. So you guys understand poop, crap, right? So I'm telling my wife to go download crap. <laughs> How does that work out, right? It doesn't work. So literally, my wife said, I'm not going to download that app. <laughs> and the other day, I wanted to do an experiment. So I am the general manager of Asia Pacific, and at Evernote, we have a general manager of Latin America. So I wanted to do an experiment, and his name is Luis. So I said, hey, Luis, download Taco Talk. <laughs> and he said, same reaction. It was even worse than my wife, though. He's like, what? What are you talking about, you know? And so, if you're creating a brand that will require people to tell their friends to download crap, it's not gonna work, right? So, it's interesting, if you look at the marketplace, Kakao Chak is extremely popular in Korea. It's like way popular. Like if, if I were to ask who's on Kakao Talk, almost everyone would raise their hand in Korea. But if you go outside of Korea, especially to those countries that I mentioned, in fact, I think I put it together, they just killed all these countries as far as the market. Because nobody in Europe's gonna download it. Nobody in America, nobody in Canada, uh, Australia, South America is gonna download this app because it sounds weird, okay? So, I still don't think that they even understand that that's the case. In fact, I probably should contact them and tell them. Um, but that's a good example when you're naming your company, when you're coming up with, it may sound really cool in Bahasa, but you just need to run it by a few other areas of the world to make sure that it isn't weird in some other language, right? So that's a, a big consideration. Now there's another company out of Korea. Now how many people are using Line? Oh, more? Okay, okay, that's typically the case. So Line is the same thing, it's like WhatsApp, right? So Line sounds great. I can tell my wife, go download Line, and she'll say, okay. Right? So it's much easier to share. So if you look at the users of Line, which again is a Korean company, it is all over the world. It's done very well and it's now surpassed Kakao Talk as far as number of users. So choosing your company name and your brand is extremely, extremely important. Language, okay? I scared a few people, sorry, I, no, I didn't realize my own power. Um, language is very important. So if you're creating a, a, an app that's gonna be in different languages, you need to make sure that every interaction with your consumer, with whoever's using this application, that it, it feels normal, right? So the other day, I'm kind of mentoring a startup out of Korea called Flava. Anyone heard of Flava? Not yet? Okay. It's kind of like a life logging type service. It's like a diary type service. And I, I signed up for them and I got an email, a welcome email. Now, uh, English is, is, you guys speak great English, so you'll be able to understand this even though it may be your second language. But let me read this and, and think to yourselves if this sounds like normal English or not. So I'm going to read you the welcome email that Flava sent to me uh, like a couple weeks ago. So it says, hello, Troy Malone. Welcome to Flava. Good beginning. Flava LifeLog service is that you can store valuable memories of your life on your private space and also cloud. Little weird, but I generally get the point. Now, now listen to this next sentence. Please enjoy our service and hope your life gonna be a happy with Flava. <laughs> Let me read that again. Please enjoy our service and hope your life gonna be a happy with Flava. So, it, 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 that makes no sense, right? So, here is a welcome email that's being sent out to thousands of people, 
probably hundreds of people every day, and your first impression is these guys didn't do their homework. They, why would I use this? It's probably a bad app because they can't even create a sentence from it. So if they would have just run this English by a native speaker really quickly and said, can you help us out here? It would have made all the difference in the world. Because when you capture, capturing a new user is the hardest thing. So when you capture a new user and they download your app, you don't want them to go away. So you don't want to put this kind of stuff out there. You want to make sure that they're excited to continue to use your application, right? So language is a key thing that's very important. Culture is, is very important and kind of understanding the nuances of culture. So um, about, anyone heard of TechCrunch Disrupt? No, it's, it's kind of a big show for uh, startups, and a lot of startups come from overseas to Silicon Valley and kind of show off what they've created. And there is a company called SomeNote, S-O-M Note, and it's a cool note-taking service. It's like a very simple note-taking service focused on kind of like taking text notes on your device, okay? And the founder came and, and wore this sign around his neck that said, Evernote for women. And I have to confess, all my examples are from Korea. I don't know why. They're not doing that well. But this guy's from Korea. And um, what happened is he wore this sign, and then what happened is there's a number of uh, female bloggers and journalists that saw this, and they got offended. And they said, what do you think, Evernote is too complex for us simple females to understand? And kind of had that reaction to him. And the stuff that they wrote about him was very, very negative. So he tried to launch his company into a new marketplace, and he ended up offending half of the marketplace. So it was a bad, bad example of not understanding really how to market in a different marketplace. So it's a challenge, it's definitely a, a big challenge. Okay, so that ends the formalized section of my presentation, but uh, before I get to questions, I would like to do something um, that will hopefully make this a little more fun. Now, I've, I've seen this done before, and let me check the uh, time here. I've seen, I've seen this done before and it worked really well, so I am now going to try it myself, and now it probably won't work. But so what we're going to do? Are, do you guys here in in Indonesia do rock paper scissors? Rock paper scissors. Do you know that game? Yes. Very good. Okay. So what we're going to do is I, I have a few um, kind of shirts and uh, cards to give away that'll give you Evernote Premium for one year, which is like. $60 of, of value there. Um, so what I, let me give you the rules as to how this is gonna work because we've got a lot of people here. So I'll have, what we'll do is we're gonna play rock, paper, scissors together, okay? Now, if you, if I beat you, we'll, we'll have everyone stand up and then if I beat you, you'll sit down, okay? And then if you tie me, so if I throw a rock, and you throw a rock, then you sit down. But if you beat me, you stay standing, okay? And we're gonna do this until we get to anywhere from five to seven people left, okay? So everyone stand up. Okay, everyone standing? Okay, so remember, the first rule is, if, if I beat you, then you sit down. If I tie you, if we throw the same thing, then you, you also sit down. The only way that you can stay standing is if you beat me, okay? Are you ready? Okay. 
rock, paper, scissors. Okay? Go throw paper, sit down if you threw paper or if you, or if you have a rock. Okay? Be honest now. <laughs> okay. Rock, paper, scissors. Okay, all the rocks stay up. All the rocks stay up. Okay. Now, if you have paper, you sit down. Did you have paper? Yeah, paper sits down. Okay, here we go. Rock, paper, scissors. So we're getting there, we're getting there. All right, watch closely. Who's gonna get it? Rock, paper, scissors. All the rocks, sit down, there were a lot of rocks, I saw a lot of rocks. All papers. Okay, we are almost there. We're almost there. Okay, are you ready? Rock, paper, scissors. Seats. If you guys could tell me by a show of hands, 
how many people are, uh, I, I would imagine this is almost everyone, is using Facebook? Do something like that. Yeah, that's, I don't think, I don't think those numbers have ever been higher, and I think it's a, because there's such great opportunities now. So that's great. Good, good luck to you. Um, now, let's get to some questions, okay? So as, as we've been talking about going global, or even application questions, etc., I want to hear what you guys are thinking. I'm tired of kind of hearing me talk. I'd rather hear what you guys are thinking. What questions do you guys have? And we we can run, I think Sartika has, yeah, she has the uh, uh, microphone here, so you have to be not too embarrassed to ask a question, but who, who has a question out here? Where's our first question from? Kalau mau tanya, dalam bahasa Indonesia nanti saya bahas translate. Ya? Well, you can, you can ask, and you feel free to ask in Bahasa, and she can translate. That shouldn't be an excuse. Yeah. This is your big English test. <laughs> yeah. uh, 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 So the 35 million are okay, um, but he, here's here's my here's what I would do. This doesn't mean it's the right answer, but this is what I would do. Um, as soon as I understood that we had a problem expanding our business overseas, like into different countries, I would start asking a lot of questions because Kakao Talk grew extremely quickly in Korea. It was an amazing application in Korea. Everyone was using it, right? So they knew that their application was good and they knew that people would talk about it to their friends and, and use it with their friends. So once they saw the statistics that they were not getting really anyone in Europe, uh, you know, North America, South America, etc., that's when they should have asked some questions. And once they figure out that that's the problem, then what they could do is they could do a, you, you can fork a brand, they say. A fork is when you go kind of two separate ways, right? So you could have Kakao Talk in Korea that is a popular brand in Korea, but they could have named their app Line for outside and put it into external app stores. So the good thing about app stores is it allows you to sell your app in each separate country differently. So you can have a different APK, a different branding in Indonesia than you have in um, Africa, right? So they didn't have a problem where their brand was widely known all around the world. It was widely known just in Korea. So I think what they could have done is forked the brand and, and had two separate brands, one for outside Korea and one for inside Korea. And there's there's a few examples of that. I know that uh, ten. Do you guys know Tencent? That they are China. 
Um, there's a company in China that's very huge, in, and, and they're named Tencent. And they've made a browser called the QQ Browser. Do you know the QQ Browser? Have you ever heard of the QQ Browser? A few of you have. It's, it's a browser for your mobile phone, but they rebranded it for India specifically, and they called it One Browser. I don't know why, but they did, and that's what I would have done with Kakaoku. Uh, I think Evernote also having another question in China. <coughs> yes, yeah. that's a great point. Um, we about wow, man, five five months ago or so, we launched our China product, and we have a different brand for our China product. It's called Yijang BG. Is Evernote in China? So we have a totally separate brand that the elephant is the same, so the logo is the same, but the name of the company is different. Uh, and the reason that we did that is we wanted to have a separate brand for uh, China specifically because it's such a huge marketplace. We wanted to really have the name be something that was comfortable to someone in China. Whereas Evernote is not a comfortable name for someone in China to say, but Yijang Biji is. So we've done it as well. Good, great points, I think I forgot. <laughs> okay, is that answering your question? Okay, next. Oh, which one go first? I think he first. Oh, the back. <laughs> yeah, we'll get them all. We, we've got time. You still have goodies, right? Yeah. <laughs> no worries. We might have to play Papa Rock, Paper, Scissors, and Okay, please. Uh, we know that. Uh, your name, please, and your uh, partner. Anthony Sihan, uh, from Computer Science. Okay. Uh, we know that software or team taking, taking picture, analyst number, and words always have this memory. And how can you solve the problem? Uh, can you repeat it? Yeah, repeat it. We know that software will remember things, taking picture, analyze numbers, and words always have huge memory. Huge memory. How can you solve solve the problem? Did you solve? Uh, did, did you have some solution to minimize their memory for taking picture? Oh, on, you mean on the device? Yes. Like device memory. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I thought you meant this memory. <laughs> I have problems with this memory, not my device memory. Uh, yeah, so that, that's a good question. So this is the way... We, we thought really hard about this, okay? Because when you think about it, if, if you're taking a ton of pictures on these new phones that have like 8 megapixel, 10 megapixel cameras, that's like huge, memory wise. So what we do is we have two options in the settings, okay? So if I take out my mobile phone and take a picture of my door in my hotel, right? The number of my hotel room. Um, I can choose to either save that on my device as a backup, or I can choose just to upload it to Evernote and not save it on my device. So you can make a choice as to what you want to do there. We also do that with audio. So if I record audio, if I come up with an idea and I just record it really quick on my phone, that gets uploaded to our server and it doesn't take up memory on the device. Now, if you're a premium user, so all these guys who got premium cards, if you're a premium user of Evernote, you can create what's called an offline notebook which downloads all of the notes to your device. So you need to have more memory in order to do that. So it's up to the user. If the user doesn't want to use much memory, they don't have to download notes to their device. They can just access them through the internet. Uh, but if they do have a lot of memory and they want to have them available on their device without internet connection, then they can do that as well. Good question, because that, that's a big problem. Next. 
We'll get you, don't you worry. <laughs> Hello, my name is Sandy, I'm from Computer Science. Um, for, me, for me personally, uh, the logo, logo um, it's kind of boring. <laughs> But my question is, uh, how can I make that uh, sorry, uh, boring logo that doesn't make make that boring logo become popular to the world? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I think I think you can definitely find our logo boring. I'm fine with that. Um, I think br brand is a very important thing. Um, and I think that you can find examples of kind of like, you know the Nike swoosh? It's kind of boring, right? But yet it represents a very important brand, right? So I think there's two components. You've got the company that you're building and the application that you're building around them is what needs to be exciting. So the Evernote logo may be boring to some people, but if you go and ask Evernote users, people that are really using Evernote and recommending it to their friends, it's 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 not boring. It's very cool. They love it. You know, <laughs> they fall in love with it. So, in fact, uh, you know, it's interesting. Remember how I said like in Japan we're very popular. In Japan, one of those books that was written about us, there was a whole chapter about our logo. And they went to a university in, in Japan, it was Keio University in Japan, and they had a biologist who was an expert on elephants analyze our logo, and they figured out that it was a female African elephant. We don't know if that's true or not, but she did a big analysis on the shape of the ear, the fact that it didn't have tusks, and the way it was oriented, its head, they, they, they came, it, it, it was hilarious. So I, I think that, that a logo can be boring, but the brand associated with it is what needs to be built and what needs to be created. And that brand becomes part of people. Now let's think about brands. The Apple logo, pretty boring. The Nike logo, pretty boring, right? But when you think about the brand that they have built around that logo, those logos are the best, right? Like, like they're, they're the tops. Because people love the brand, the products, and what the company is doing. So this is a lot, of, we've been putting a lot of thought into this because we're getting to the point now where our brand is becoming much more global and people are attaching to our brand, you know, very nicely. So we're actually, has anyone heard of moleskin? It's like, a, they, they make like notebooks that you can like draw and sketch in. We just came out with a moleskin notebook, branded Evernote. And that was kind of a big deal. You saw the launch of that in the US. Uh, it was kind of a big deal throughout the world. So I think that our logo may be boring, but I think that the brand that we're building around the logo is what needs to be exciting and compelling. I think maybe people here just know about the phrase in uh, in the U.S. about the elephant and the remember everything things. So. Yes. Yeah, and and the reason that we we chose an elephant, which we get asked a lot uh, throughout Asia, because elephants have more meaning in Asia. Um, in English, there's a saying: "Elephants never forget." Right? Has anyone heard that? Um, so that's why we chose the elephant, because we're all about memory and remembering things. So because elephants never forget, we figured, oh, well, that's great. <laughs> Let's use an elephant. So that's why we chose the elephant. Yeah. Uh, I personally think it's quite catchy, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Now, now it, it may be boring, but when you put pink elephants together in a design like this, it starts to become more exciting, right? <laughs> Okay, so uh, moving on to the next question on oh, the back. Yeah, very back in the red yeah. shirt. The yeah, he's, he's been. He's like, very interesting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Hello. 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 Sorry, sir. 
What's your name, please? I don't. Uh, I was kind of late, so sorry, because um, something happens uh, uh, during I'm uh, going here. So, what's your name, please? I'm Troy. What's Trolley? Troy. <laughs> Troy. A little bit, um, you know, ridiculous question uh, because I didn't get your point because I come late, exactly. And I'll ask you: you say that uh, there are uh, more uh, interesting overs for students, huh? Right? Interesting overs uh, from your application. Overs from overs. Oh, double F E R S. Double F E R over. Offers. Offers. Oh yes, of course. Sorry, my pronunciation. Okay. I'm the beginner of the English, so I like to ask in English, okay? I'm trying. I'm trying, sir. And, uh, so, what's the overs that you would like to give us? Um, uh, you know, I will, uh, basically, I would like to uh, to know what kind of what kind of overs that you want to give us and more features, something like that, or. Something like, uh, like, like how you would use it. Right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. That is interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I think I think I'm gonna have a new name of Charlie. Right? <laughs> Very good question. Thank you. And, and and that was a good question, even though you came in late. So good, well done. So what what what? So what's the big deal about Evernote for students? Um, uh, it, number one, Evernote is free, okay? So that's a good thing. So you can download Evernote and start using it for free. And here, here are some interesting applications that we find with students. So let's say that you're doing some research online, right? and you're looking online for this, that, and the other, we have a web clipper that you can install into your browser. So if you see a web page that contains information that you want to remember, you can easily click the web clipper and it automatically goes into your, to your Evernote thing. So big deal, what does that mean? That means that you can be doing that in the computer lab, and then when you get home on your home computer, that information would be there. It would be on your mobile phone. It would be everywhere. So it synchronizes all of your information wherever you want to have it. So I told you that I speak Korean. So I guess I'm a continuing student of language. And I use Evernote for um, vocabulary. So whenever I hear a Korean word that I don't recognize, I'll write it down in Evernote in kind of like a vocabulary list. And then whenever I'm like on an airplane or have free time anywhere, I can easily pull out my phone and review my vocabulary words. So that's just one example that I use it for. Um, another interesting thing that you could use it for is if you're in class and the lecturer is talking about a subject or is really talking about something that's very difficult to understand, you can pull out your mobile phone, create a new note in Evernote and start recording. And you can record that lecture and then when you're commuting back to your home or later that night, you could be going to sleep. You could put, now I know that you guys might not you know, want to listen to music, but you, you could put your earphones in while you're commuting and listen to that lecture again so that you kind of get it more. Uh, you can also take pictures of the whiteboard after the, the professor or lecturer is done kind of writing a bunch of stuff on the, on the lecture board. You can take a picture of that in Evernote but the neat thing is, and I don't know if you missed this part or not, is that we do handwriting recognition. So you could search for the topic that the teacher was talking about, and it would pull up that image, which is a great way to find your images again. Um, and, you know, there's a myriad of other ways that, that students are using it. Some people use it for, uh, you know, when they're, when they're reading uh, books about the trade that they're going into, they'll take notes in Evernote on what they're reading so that they can remember that. You can also scan information into Evernote. So if there's physical paper, uh, for instance, like your uh, diploma, uh, when you graduate, you could put that in there. 
I have my passport information in Evernote. I have e everything in Evernote. You can put any document you want in there so that you never have to worry about losing that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of ways that, that students can use it. And you can also share notebooks. So if you have a group of people you're working with, you can share a notebook and you can all put research into that same notebook and share it. So there's a lot of ways that you can use it with students. But the, the big thing is, is it's free, so you can download it and start experimenting with it. And I would recommend if you do download it, download it for your phone and download it for your computer and any other device that you have. And that's where you'll kind of see the power of synchronization of all that information. Okay, so is that answering your question about what Evernote offers? Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll back. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's find a lady. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> Good afternoon, sir. Hello. Uh, my name is Denon and I'm from Information Systems Department. So my question is, sorry. what was the most complicated problem you have ever encountered since you first developed Evernote until now, and how did you solve it? Thank you. Great, great question. Um, <clears throat> so. They're, they're, I would say on the technology side, the, the biggest problem with Evernote was growth. We grew so quickly, trying to keep up with all the growth technologically is very, very difficult. Um, so we are architected into shards. So we, 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 each server that we have houses about 125,000 users. And we divide those up into shards. So that if one of those shards goes down, it doesn't affect all of our 35 million users. So we, we've architected ourselves in such a way that we've minimized the risk of losing data or, or having those types of issues. Um, that was a major hurdle to figure out early on. Uh, but also, I think, Another major difficulty was figuring out handwriting recognition. So we do handwriting recognition for English, um, and it, it would work, you know, in, in any kind of romanized letters would work. Um, and we also do it for Japanese, which was very, very difficult. And we're working on a few other Asian languages that are very, very challenging to figure that out. So that's another challenge. Another challenge is, when you put a bunch of stuff into Evernote, how do you get it back out? That, it's only valuable if you can pull it out, right? So we're working with a lot of machine learning right now to make your notes smarter. And that's a big hurdle for us right now that we're working on. So we just hired on a number of machine learning people uh, that are working on making Evernote smarter with the stuff that you put into it. So there's always hurdles technologically to make the product better, and I think that we're just kind of crossing them one at a time. That's a good question. There's always hurdles. Uh, perhaps you can explain about uh, what is the shard that you mentioned? Yeah, so the way the shard works is um, you can have one huge database, right, with 35 million users in it. But what happens if something happens to that particular database? Your whole business kind of goes away, it goes down, right? Remember when Twitter was growing so fast? And they kept, you get the fail whale, you know, it kept crashing and everyone was kind of upset about that. You get those kind of issues. So the shard system allows you to divide up this database into what are called shards or sections. And it isolates those users from each other and the data from each other. So if one goes down, it's not catastrophic. It's, it, it isn't a huge, huge problem, but it's something that you can fix and restore and not have too many people get upset with you. So that's that's an important architectural decision. Okay, uh, is that answering your question? Okay. 
Uh, so basically, like what he mentioned, this is an algorithm class, right? Yeah. So you can see from his point of view that algorithms and artificial intelligence that you might uh, study later on is also useful. So <laughs> this class is supposed to be important, right? Because basically, people like to students kind of. Uh, not that to just algorithms. <laughs> yeah, well, let me let me just really quickly about algorithms. Um, we, we remember I said that we have something called Evernote Food, a product that's focused on meals and food. Um, we brought in an intern who was a machine learning intern, so artificial intelligence intern, and the job that this intern had and that he had to solve was. We told him that he had to look through anyone's notes in Evernote, and I personally have over 4,000 notes, so it's a lot of data. But he had to look and analyze an account and determine what was a recipe and what was not. And he had, and our hurdle that we gave him is that he had to be able to determine a recipe with 97% accuracy. And then what we're gonna do with that is if you have a food entry into Evernote Food and you have a related recipe, we're gonna automatically, excuse me, here's a new English word, listen, listen to this one, automatically connect those so that you think that your, your Evernote is getting, getting all the more smarter. So algorithms are very, very important. Okay, moving on. This <laughs> Yeah, we'll be up back to you. Uh, hello, my name is Kevin Yudea from Information System. Uh, uh, I have two questions if you don't if you don't know. Uh, my first question, I hope this isn't too sensitive. Uh, I was wondering about how ever not be money. I know about the premium account, but uh, do you ever not get money from selling information that we posted on our notes? Uh, I mean, everyone else has that, like Google Docs and all that. Uh, the second is, uh, we Indonesians have problems with slow internet. So, uh, that's, that is, that's my biggest problem with using uh, cloud storage. So, uh, is, do you have any solutions for us with slow internet to use cloud storage? Thank you. Great questions. First thing, we never use or will use your data to make money off you. That's the big difference between Evernote and a lot of the other companies out there, is we're very upfront about the fact that we won't do that. We have a very simple business model, so the only way that we make money is we have a premium uh, service that people can subscribe to and it gives them a few more features uh, and that's uh, $5 a month or $45 a year USD um, and we have about 2 million paying users right now so that's how we make our money um, but the, the key point is early on and, and this is a big business decision when you're doing freemium model and a lot of VCs and investors have studied Evernote because we've been successful doing this. If you're doing a freemium model, don't create what's called um, crippleware. So what crippleware means is that you create a product, and you've probably dealt with this, you download an app, and it's crippled in some way. It's, it's you know, and you have to pay to make it valuable, right? We don't believe in that. Our free application is usable by 95% of the people that download it, and they love it, the free app. It's not Cripple Web, it's really good software. But about 5% of our users want a little more, and they want to pay for it, and that's how we make our money. So we don't deal with the data in any way as far as making money. Um, and then as far as slow internet goes, luckily we don't have latency issues here, but if you're taking pictures and uploading that to the server, that can be slow, right? Although here in Jakarta, I don't notice it. Um, like, you know, it's pretty much, pretty pretty quick. And I'm on a local SIM card. Uh, so, you know, 
Now, we're not so much a cloud storage solution like Dropbox or something like that where you're really uploading on a lot of stuff. So you might be doing a text file or a quick audio note that may be 50K, you know? So we're not doing real heavy things, but when you're on your computer, say at home, you might drag a PowerPoint file into Evernote, and that might be, a, you know, a little tough to synchronize up to the, to the system. So I don't really have an answer for that, um, but I think that you can kind of morph your use and usage around the limitations. And I'm also looking at doing a hackathon here in Jakarta to come up with a phone-based app for lower-end devices that aren't as fast and don't have as high of a resolution as like a higher-end Android device. And we would have a separate application and we may have some uh, compression involved with that one, which would help with that. That's part of localizing to a market. Good question. Okay. Can I answer your question? Wait. Um, okay. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is Reza. Uh, I want to ask about privacy. You said that uh, you store your information like passports like that. Uh, for me, that's an um, important document. So how can I be sure that uh, it's secure to uh, store that document in the internet? And how can I be sure that people cannot hack it yeah, like that? Thank you. Yeah, that's a good thing. Good, good question. If you, if you have your mobile phone uh, and you don't have what's called a pin lock on your mobile phone, then I could open up your Evernote account or any other account for that matter, right? And kind of look at all your stuff. So if you're storing any sensitive information in Evernote, we recommend having either a pin lock on your phone or a pin lock on Evernote. And we provide the ability to put a pin lock on Evernote. Whenever I store a password in Evernote, on the desktop client, whether it be Windows or Mac, you can highlight the password and encrypt it so it doesn't show, and you have to enter another password to unencrypt it and view it. So there's a lot of ways that you can kind of keep your stuff uh, safe from people seeing it, but you always have to be careful about that kind of stuff. Good question. Okay, any questions? <laughs> Finally, Adam. I see you there. We won't forget about you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Nama saya Marcial dari Teknik Informatika. Pertanyaannya, kita tahu setiap tahun banyak aplikasi yang bermunculan. Apa upaya atau tindakan yang dilakukan oleh Evernote untuk tetap dapat eksis atau populer? Um, he was asking about uh, what Evernote do to, to keep on existing in the application world. To stay relevant. Yeah, to keep, stay relevant and uh, to keep up with the competition. Yeah, good, very good problem to be thinking about. Yeah, because uh, because you're never you're never safe. You know, because everyone else is moving, etc. One of the things that we've done, and our CEO has really made this the culture, is he has said that all of our focus should be on the application. And if we focus on building the best application, then we will win, and we can continue to win. Um, it used to be that you needed to really pay attention to your competition and wonder what they're doing, wonder what they're doing, and then try to do that. And we've taken a different approach of just focusing on our product alone and making sure it's the best product that, that we love. And that has been a successful strategy in, in succeeding. Uh, so that, that's what I would say, is focus on the product. Because the market has changed to where the product drives all your marketing and all of your distribution. Good products win. Okay, um, How about that girl up there in the oh, yeah. pink? Yeah. Let's give it to the next thing. <laughs> She's been asking for a few times now. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. Um, good afternoon, Chef. Uh, my name is Zewa from 
industrial engineering course, and I was uh, asked about premium, premium, premium of Evernote. And as you said before, that we can download Evernote free. Uh, but I saw you that you give some voucher of premium from people there, and you say that premium is about sixty dollars. What is the additional features from Sure. Yeah. Uh, so Premium gives about 10 different additional features to Evernote. One that's most noticeable is with the free client, you can upload 60 megabytes of notes every month. So every month, you can upload 60 megabytes with the free. Um, but with uh, premium, you can upload one gigabyte of notes every month, right? So you get more ability to upload more. Uh, you also can create offline notebooks with premium. So if you're premium, you can specify certain notebooks within Evernote to be downloaded to your device so that you don't need an internet connection to access those notes. So if you travel a lot on an airplane and you have to turn your phone off but you still want to see your notes, that's a good example. So business, people that are in business life. Um, one other feature is if you put a PDF into Evernote, in the free client, you can search by the title of that PDF. But if you're premium, we will search through the whole PDF by keyword. So think little things like that. The part that you that he was giving away was for one year, so it's it's not that expensive for uh, the monthly fee, right? Right, right. And and the way premium works, let's say that you had a bunch of documents that you wanted to scan and put into Evernote, you could just pay five dollars for one month, scan all that stuff in, and then go back to free, and you don't lose anything by going back to free. You keep all of your notes. Okay. Okay. Anyone got more questions? We need one from this side. Okay. I haven't seen this side in a while. Let's give it to him. Good afternoon, Dr. Sir. My name is Ray Stefan from Computer Science. Uh, I have two questions about, for you. Uh, the first is, uh, may you share some tips about how to find a unique idea to make a, a application? So the, uh, our, our application, my application is different than any any same application, just like as a note. I think there's many note application, but Asana is different, so we can have many users in many countries. That's my first question. And the second is, uh, I want to know about the first motivation or the first thing behind the making of Asana. So, uh, what intention, first intention that you want to make this Asana application? Thank you. Great question. Um, <coughs> Innovation, right? Innovation, doing things differently, uniqueness is very difficult because, I mean, I, I know that there's some very big companies right now that are trying to figure out how this very question, how do we innovate? How do we come up with new ideas? And they have no clue. They don't know how to do it. Um, I think the first rule of coming up with something that's unique is being a little crazy. I mean, think about it. Most everything that you guys think about, it has a filter. Do you guys know what a filter is? You kind of, you know, it goes through a filter of what you think will work or not. And to be truly unique, you need to be a little crazy. Okay? So, when you think about a lot of the ideas that have happened in the world that have been truly unique, 
most people say, oh, you can't do that. There's no way, right? So I think our CEO describes it this way. When, when our CEO was, was thinking about Evernote, he would go to people and he would say, hey, I'm thinking of creating uh, a system for memory so that it'll help everyone remember. And it'll be your second brain, is what he would say. And, and he said, to a person, everyone that he told that to, they would say, <laughs> that's crazy, but I sure could use that. So his analysis was, the first part when they said, ah, oh, that's crazy, meant that he wouldn't have much competition, right? It's unique. And then when they came back and said, but I sure would use that, he immediately said there's a big market for that. And that was kind of the beginning of pursuing Evernote. So I think to be unique, to come up with something that is truly innovative, you've got to not be scared to fail. In fact, you need to embrace failing a few times to make it happen. Okay? So, that's, that's, I mean, think about Thomas Edison, when he invented the light bulb, I think he failed like 2,000 times, and people thought he was crazy, but he finally found the right combination to make it work. And he didn't think that that was failures, he just found 2,000 ways not to build the light bulb, right? Okay, is that uh, answering your question? The second question. He, he oh, the, the, the motivation of the, uh, when he, the Evernote was built in the first place. Right, the motivation for Evernote. So, so, and this is another key to innovation. Most successful ideas are, are done by people who are not looking to build something for someone else. They're done by people that want to build something for themselves. Okay? So, our CEO wanted a better memory. He literally thought, wouldn't that be cool if there was an easy way to make sure that you could remember anything you wanted to? And that was his personal desire. Now he had built two other companies before Evernote, and those companies were focused on building stuff for other people, right? And I think one of the keys to innovation is truly creating something that solves a problem for you, and then many times you become pleasantly surprised by realizing that, that many other people have that problem. So the motivation was he just wanted a better memory, and he started to go with that thought, and that was the motivation that really drove the vision of whatever it was to become. Okay. Is that answering the second one? Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we still have last question. One last question. Which one, which one do you want? Let's do quite Let, Let's try to fit both in. You guys are almost exactly opposite. So let, let's do over here first and then okay. we'll do you. Second. that we're, we're you know, kind of going in the right direction to make that happen. 
Um, but really, we're focused on building a product that billions of people will be able to use. So that's our goal. And then we have over here. Okay. One last one. Next one. The girl back there.